Hello there to you. I find that I have a totally good reason for being cheerful today, and that's because you have joined me again. This is day number 149. Today we read 1 Samuel 18 and 19, Psalm 102, and our first reading in Romans 7. So, looking forward again to precious treasures in God's Word, let's turn to 1 Samuel 18 and 19. In yesterday's story, David showed that he was more concerned with God's reputation than for his own safety. May we all face our imposing enemies with more belief in the unseen God than in the very present enemies. 1 Samuel 18 Saul and David finished their conversation. After that, Saul's son Jonathan was deeply attracted to David and came to love him as much as he loved himself. Saul kept David with him from that day and did not let him go back home. Jonathan swore eternal friendship with David because of his deep affection for him. He took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, together with his armor and also his sword, bow, and belt. David was successful in all the missions on which Saul sent him, and so Saul made him an officer in his army. This pleased all of Saul's officers and men. As David was returning after killing Goliath, and as the soldiers were coming back home, women from every town in Israel came out to meet King Saul. They were singing joyful songs, dancing, and playing tambourines and lyres. In their celebration, the women sang, Saul has killed thousands, but David tens of thousands. Saul did not like this, and he became very angry. He said, For David they claim tens of thousands, but only thousands for me. They will be making him king next. And so he was jealous and suspicious of David from that day on. The next day an evil spirit from God suddenly took control of Saul, and he raved in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp, as he did every day, and Saul was holding a spear. "'I'll pin him to the wall,' Saul said to himself, and he threw the spear at him twice. But David dodged each time." Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had abandoned him. So Saul sent him away and put him in command of a thousand men. David led his men in battle and was successful in all he did because the Lord was with him. Saul noticed David's success and became even more afraid of him. But everyone in Israel and Judah loved David because he was such a successful leader. Then Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter Merab. I will give her to you as your wife on condition that you serve me as a brave and loyal soldier and fight the Lord's battles. Saul was thinking that in this way the Philistines would kill David and he would not have to do it himself. David answered, Who am I and what is my family that I should become the king's son-in-law? But when the time came for Merab to be given to David, she was given instead to a man named Adriel from Mahola. Saul's daughter Michal, however, fell in love with David, and when Saul heard of this, he was pleased. He said to himself, I'll give Michal to David. I will use her to trap him, and he will be killed by the Philistines. So for the second time, Saul said to David, You will be my son-in-law. He ordered his officials to speak privately with David and tell him, The king is pleased with you and all his officials like you. Now is a good time for you to marry his daughter. So they told this to David, and he answered, It's a great honor to become the king's son-in-law too great for someone poor and insignificant like me. The officials told Saul what David had said, and Saul ordered them to tell David, 
All the king wants from you as payment for the bride are the foreskins of a hundred dead Philistines as revenge on his enemies. This is how Saul planned to have David killed by the Philistines. Saul's officials reported to David what Saul had said, and David was delighted with the thought of becoming the king's son-in-law. Before the day set for the wedding, David and his men went and killed two hundred Philistines. He took their foreskins to the king and counted them all out to him, so that he might become his son-in-law. So Saul had to give his daughter Michal in marriage to David. Saul realized clearly that the Lord was with David and also that his daughter Michal loved him. So he became even more afraid of David and was his enemy as long as he lived. The Philistine armies would come and fight, but in every battle David was more successful than any of Saul's other officers. As a result, David became very famous. 1 Samuel 19 Saul told his son Jonathan and all his officials that he planned to kill David, but Jonathan was very fond of David, and so he told him, My father is trying to kill you. Please be careful tomorrow morning. Hide in some secret place and stay there. I will go and stand by my father in the field where you are hiding, and I will speak to him about you. If I find out anything, I will let you know. Jonathan praised David to Saul and said, Sir, don't do wrong to your servant David. He has never done you any wrong. On the contrary, everything he has done has been a great help to you. He risked his life when he killed Goliath, and the Lord won a great victory for Israel. When you saw it, you were glad. Why then do you now want to do wrong to an innocent man and kill David for no reason at all? Saul was convinced by what Jonathan said and made a vow in the Lord's name that he would not kill David. So Jonathan called David and told him everything. Then he took him to Saul, and David served the king as he had before. War with the Philistines broke out again. David attacked them and defeated them so thoroughly that they fled. One day an evil spirit from the Lord took control of Saul. He was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was there, playing his harp. Saul tried to pin David to the wall with his spear, but David dodged, and the spear stuck in the wall. David ran away and escaped. That same night Saul sent some men to watch David's house and kill him the next morning. Michal, David's wife, warned him, If you don't get away tonight, tomorrow you will be dead. So she let him down from a window, and he ran away and escaped. Then she took the household idol, laid it on the bed, put a pillow made of goat's hair at its head, and put a cover over it. When Saul's men came to get David, Michal told them that he was sick. But Saul sent them back to see David for themselves. He ordered them, Carry him here in his bed, and I will kill him. They went inside and found the household idol in the bed and the goat's hair pillow at its head. Saul asked Michal, Why have you tricked me like this and let my enemy escape? She answered, He said he would kill me if I didn't help him escape. David escaped and went to Samuel in Ramah and told him everything that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naioth and stayed there. Saul was told that David was in Naioth in Ramah, so he sent some men to arrest him. They saw the group of prophets dancing and shouting with Samuel as their leader. Then the Spirit of God took control of Saul's men, and they also began to dance and shout. When Saul heard this, he sent more messengers, and they also began to dance and shout. He sent messengers the third time, and the same thing happened to them. Then he himself started out to Ramah. 
When he came to the large well in Seku, he asked where Samuel and David were and was told that they were in Nioth. And as he was going there, the Spirit of God took control of him also, and he danced and shouted all the way to Nioth. He took off his clothes and danced and shouted in Samuel's presence and lay naked all that day and all that night. This is how the saying originated, has even Saul become a prophet. Now let's turn to Psalm 102. This psalm starts out like the prayer of anyone in distress and trouble calling out to God. As we read further, many see parallels with what our Savior would have prayed in His darkest days on earth. The Hebrew title is A Prayer by a Weary Sufferer Who Pours Out His Complaints to the Lord. Psalm 102 Listen to my prayer, O Lord. Hear my cry for help. When I'm in trouble, please don't turn away from me. Listen to me and answer me quickly when I call. My life is disappearing like smoke. My body is burning like fire. I am beaten down like dry grass. I have lost my desire for food. I groan aloud. I am nothing but skin and bones. I'm like a wild bird in the desert, like an owl in abandoned ruins. I lie awake. I am like a lonely bird on a housetop. All day long my enemies insult me. Those who mock me use my name in cursing. Because of your anger and fury, ashes are my food, and my tears are mixed with my drink. You picked me up and threw me away. My life is like the evening shadows. I'm like dry grass. But you, O Lord, are king forever. All generations will remember you. You will rise and take pity on Zion. The time has come to have mercy on her. This is the right time. Your servants love her even though she is destroyed. They have pity on her even though she is in ruins. The nations will fear you, Lord. All the kings of the earth will fear your power. When you, O Lord, rebuild Zion, you will reveal your greatness. You will hear your forsaken people and listen to their prayer. Write down for the coming generations what the Lord has done, so that the people not yet born will praise him. The Lord looked down from His holy place on high. He looked down from heaven to earth. He heard the groans of prisoners and set free those who were condemned to die. And so His name will be proclaimed in Zion, and He will be praised in Jerusalem when nations and kingdoms come together and worship the Lord. You, Lord, have made me weak while I am still young. You have shortened my life. O God, do not take me away now before I grow old. O Lord, you live forever. Long ago you created the earth, and with your own hands you made the heavens. They will disappear, but you will remain. They will all wear out like clothes. You will discard them like clothes, and they will vanish. But you are always the same, and your life never ends. Our children will live in safety, and under your protection, their descendants will be secure. And now, for the first time, let's turn to Romans 7. The last verse of yesterday's reading shows why it is better to take what we are given rather than what we have earned. 
This is a big problem for some. My dad's, having lived a good life, was one of the biggest blocks to him humbly coming to God and receiving the gift of eternal life. I don't think he ever understood how God would not be so impressed by his supposed integrity. The spiritual reality expressed starting at the beginning of Romans chapter 6 is a key to place along with a second key that we will hear about in today's chapter. I will start our reading with chapter 6, verse 19b, through the end of the chapter. At one time you surrendered yourselves entirely as slaves to impurity and wickedness for wicked purposes. In the same way, you must now surrender yourselves entirely as slaves of righteousness for holy purposes. When you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But what did you gain from doing the things that you are now ashamed of? The result of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and are the slaves of God. Your gain is a life fully dedicated to Him, and the result is eternal life. For sin pays its wage, death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 7 Certainly you will understand what I am about to say, my friends, because all of you know about law. The law rules over people only as long as they live. A married woman, for example, is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if he dies, then she is free from the law that bound her to him. So then, if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is legally a free woman and does not commit adultery if she marries another man. That is how it is with you, my friends. As far as the law is concerned, you also have died because you are part of the body of Christ, and now you belong to him who was raised from death in order that we might be useful in the service of God. For when we lived according to our human nature, the sinful desires stirred up by the law were at work in our bodies, and all we did ended in death. Now, however, we are free from the law because we died to that which once held us prisoners. No longer do we serve in the old way of the written law, but in the new way of the Spirit. Shall we say, then, that the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. For if the law had not said, Do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. But by means of that commandment, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of selfish desires in me. Apart from law, sin is a dead thing. I myself was once alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. And the commandment which was meant to bring life, in my case, brought death. Sin found its chance, and by means of the commandment, it deceived me and killed me. So then, the law itself is holy, and the commandment is holy, right, and good. But does this mean that what is good caused my death? By no means. It was sin that did it. By using what is good, sin brought death to me in order that its true nature as sin might be revealed. And so, by means of the commandment, sin is shown to be even more terribly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, 
But I am mortal, sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I do, for I don't do what I would like to do, but instead I do what I hate. Since I do what I don't want to do, this shows that I agree that the law is right. So I'm not really the one who does this thing. Rather, it is the sin that lives in me. I read too far. I should have stopped at 17. So I am not really the one who does this thing. Rather, it is the sin that lives in me. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord Jesus, help us to understand and correctly interpret what Paul has written. We see in this book that our salvation is based on your blood shed on the cross, not on any good works that we do or our attempts to lead a sinless life. Our union with you brings new life, and we are born again. But how does this really happen? I pray that you would help my listener to meditate on today's reading to find the key that I mentioned. In the process, Lord, help me and my listener to avoid these errors. Let us never seek to take advantage of your generosity and kindness to us, taking that as a license to sin. Let us never take Paul's words at the end of chapter 7 as an excuse for our sin. Let us never give up our pursuit of personal holiness, saying that we have become good enough. This means we have fallen for the sin of pride. May we never look down on others who don't seem to measure up to our standard. May we never think that we have earned enough good points in our service of you that we can trade in a few on a big moral failure. Instead, Lord, help us to focus on our union with you maintaining that precious bond with you at all cost. You're our all. You're the best. You're our joy, our righteousness. And we love you, Lord.